We want to focus on the New York civil fraud trial. We're expecting a verdict from Judge Angoran today. Talk about this. Yeah, so this is uh, obviously the civil trial that's been going on about his business dealings. Obviously, for people that have not been following this, look, it's tough to keep up with all of this stuff. There's civil, there's federal charges, there's state charges in Georgia. And so uh, what, what's at stake today in Manhattan is really around his business dealings. He could face a massive fine upwards of you know $360 million if, if they rule uh, against the former president, in addition to what he's already having to pay with the E. Jean Carroll settlement that happened a couple weeks back in the $83 million lawsuit. So that's really what's at stake and the potential for the former president to not be able to conduct business in the state of New York. And I'm sorry, that's Mike Leon, host of the Can We Please Talk podcast. Um, these charges, th these numbers are, they, they seem big at first glance. Can you talk about the scale of this? Well, it's, it's a wide scale because um, Letitia James, who, who, who's the attorney general in New York, like th these are charges that, you know, happened, I, I believe, about 12 months ago or so, where her office kind of put this together. Um, again, this is separate from the Alvin Bragg case that's happening on March 25th that just got announced uh, yesterday about the trial date and that starting. That's something completely different. So again, and that's obviously criminal charges. This is a civil matter with respect to what's happening here. So the wider implication is really on the business dealings for the former president. It's the inordinate amount that you know he would have to pay does he have 300, I don't know many people to have $367 million on hand in addition to 83 million that they just got uh, hit with uh, a couple weeks back in, in a lawsuit uh, settlement there with E. Jean Carroll, not a settlement, excuse me, a decision. But so there, there's a lot at stake here, but the biggest thing on the civil part of this is to remember that these are civil, uh, this means money will be, be exchanged and the former president will have to pay these fines uh, in accordance with whatever the court has or whatever he sets up from a payment schedule. So that's the real big takeaway for whatever comes out of today's decision. And Mike, you know, like you mentioned, the 370 something million dollars is not something everyone has just lying around. And even for a billionaire, that's still uh, that could be a lot of money. Can you talk a bit about what that kind of um, cost could mean to former President Donald Trump? Well, I mean, f for people that don't know, you know, like when the former president came into office, obviously he disassociated himself from his business dealings. So which was something that, you know, he turned over to Don and Eric uh, in terms of running the Trump organization. So he had to disassociate that uh, when you become president of the United States. Now that he's back to being a private citizen, you know, uh, he's working at the organization, but also you have the campaign part of this, which is the campaigns raising money to be able to obviously do all of these appearances and and push out all these messages to prospective voters, Republican primary voters. So um, like you said, Chris, I, I wish I had 367 million lying in my mattress somewhere. That is a, a huge fine for anybody to undergo, take. And so how money would be shifting from the former president to be able to pay for some of this is something we really don't know. I don't even think the former president may may know uh, people maybe close to him that are accountants and stuff like that would have to figure out how they would go about paying this. But the bigger implication is after you get past the money part of this is really the business dealings, because anybody that knows the Trump organization or at least knows not only from the hotel and what he does from a licensing perspective for his name, but then the properties management business that they have, they, they're in the golf business as well with some of the properties that he owns. Some of those are located in the state of New York, and a lot of the money comes from the state of New York. So this would have a trickle down effect for employees of the Trump organization that operate in the state of New York. Yeah. And, and to your point, what could it mean for other businesses? Um, could this change precedent in any way? Well, I mean, if somebody from that business is running for office, right, I mean, it could. But also. We'd have to see what, what comes out of this. You know, like, like we said, a lot of moving pieces. I can't get into Letitia James's head or, or even Alvin Bragg's head at the local level. So um, I, I would think that other folks, once the president, the, the, the fine is levied, other folks would kind of look at their books a little bit more closely. But again, this is such a unique um, case because we have a former president of the United States that at the time in 2016, you know, was operating a business and then became president of the United States. Now he's running again for for uh, another.
other fears in office. So this is it's very unique, uh, you know, the, the circumstances, at least around the individual that's being charged in this civil matter. And let's look at what Trump is saying. Can you tell us a bit about how he's commenting on this? Yeah, well, I think for the former president, look, uh, these are free campaign stops. I mean, he's mentioned this before that, like, a lot of his campaigning has been done outside of a courtroom. Well, guess what? I mean, this is free for him. Like, this is free pub. There's no such thing as bad publicity, right? All of the cameras are there. Reporters from major outlets, including this one, are there covering this, listening to what it is that he's saying. And I think the biggest thing, though, and takeaway, again, for however how you feel about him politically, I think he needs to start addressing not only the cases themselves individually, but stop repeating some of the talking points that he's saying. Save those for the campaign trails where you're around your voters. This is the time right now to kind of get in front of why you feel some of the charges are wrong. Get into the case specifics. Get into some of the things that his lawyers have argued in court that maybe have fallen on deaf ears for the judge. I, I would I would if I was advising him again, I'm not um, if I was advising him, get in front of some of the, the case particular matters and same stuff, save some of the campaign messaging for when you actually go on the trail and you're speaking to Republican primary voters that are. are, are do you want them to come out and vote for you in the primaries? And Mike, can you you mentioned these particular matters? Can you reiterate some of those for us? Yeah. So, again, a lot to cover. And uh, you can check out Can We Please Talk podcast. We cover a lot of this. Obviously, I just had uh, one of former Trump's uh, attorneys that handled the Mar-a-Lago case. So, again, four four jurisdictions, four cities. You've got uh, federal trials that would happen in D.C. around the retention of classified documents in the Mar-a-Lago case. You have the January 6th stuff, which is uh, obstruction of an official proceeding that happened there. So those are two separate cases. Again, happening uh, in Florida and D.C., but in the federal courts of both jurisdictions. In New York, you've had civil matters. So you've had the E. Jean Carroll civil suit that happened last week and the judgment that came out of that. You have today with the business dealings of the Trump organization and what will come out of that. But then you have on March 25th, which is Alvin Bragg, and that's a a criminal charge uh, with respect to the hush money payments that were made on behalf of the former president to Stormy Daniels in that case. And then last but not least is what we're kind of watching from the Georgia perspective, which is the RICO case where 19 co-defendants, including the former president, were charged in this uh, conspiracy to, you know, uh, overturn the results of the Georgia election. And that involved the phone calls that the former president made to Secretary of State, then Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, about trying to find 11,000 or so votes. That case, uh, the reason why we're watching it today is because the district attorney, Fannie Willis, and Nathan Wade had an inappropriate relationship. He was a special special prosecutor, excuse me, appointed by her uh, in terms of handling this case and kind of bringing all the evidence together and helping with the charges. They had an inappropriate relationship. They didn't go through the proper paperwork of disclosing some of that. There are some payments that were made, trips that were taken by the two of them. And so that's why we're hearing today a motion that was brought together by one of the defendants that was charged in that RICO case, in addition to the former president's lawyers that are piggybacking on this, that are saying that they they should be disqualified from uh, presiding over the case themselves or their office handling the case themselves. And if the motion is upheld, in this regard, it's going to be damning because for Georgia, they're going to have to find a new prosecutorial office that will oversee this case. And that's going to delay this case. And Fannie Willis has been wanting to bring these charges before November, which is the goal of a lot of these prosecutors. Let the voters see what happens to the former president in court before November. But as lawyers have told me, including ones that are defending the former president, there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of moving pieces that you'd be hard pressed to have any of these Mike- trials start on time. And Mike, do you think that D.A. Fonnie Willis will be disqualified based on what we've heard so far in this hearing? Well, I mean, it's very tough because Judge Scott McAfee yesterday, you know, they took a couple uh, intermittent recesses there. If you if you noticed, there was points of contention when Fannie Willis was talking about, you know, that she's getting lied on and stuff like that. I I think I mentioned yesterday to, to Steph that there was a discussion from when Nathan Wade was being questioned, but he was being questioned by an attorney that had pre- that was representing him in his divorce proceedings previously. A lot of moving pieces here. I, I just don't know. Again, there's the legal part of this, and then there's the political part of this. 
from a legal perspective, I don't know if there's enough having talked to folks in the legal community, including ones that have worked uh, in the Georgia uh, prosecutorial office. I don't know if there's enough to disbar her or disqualify her, excuse me, from this case. Disbarring her would be totally different. Um, in terms of the political matter, though, this is ammunition fodder for the former president, for Republicans in the state of Georgia. We've seen Marjorie Taylor Greene mention this. It's a tons of fodder for them to be able to use to say, look at how politically motivated some of these charges are where you have an office that doesn't even have their ducks in a row because the prosecutor in the case has a relationship with the special prosecutor that she appointed and are, is making payments to. So it just looks messy. It looks terrible. And there's a lot of uh, reasons why people did not want Fannie Willis's office to bring these charges in Georgia, uh, mainly because of this and mainly because a lot of the, the stuff is covered in Jack Smith's indictments. Mike, Fannie Willis showed up to testify yesterday with a lot of heat in her voice. Um, there was it was quite dramatic. Can you comment on that? Dramatic is an understatement, Chris. I mean, you know, look, there's two two things to this. The the first thing is that if for anybody that was not watching it yesterday, she was watching the proceedings take place from her office. She was not scheduled to be called as a witness. She was watching it from her office, just like we were watching it. She went down to the courthouse and decided to testify. So she didn't have to. So she went there, guns blazing, came in with some paperwork, some markings, said that some of the things were being lied on. So it was kind of a surprise to everybody to see her in court. So that's the first part. The second part of this is, look, Fannie Willis, you decided to engage in this relationship, not us. You can't blame the defense lawyers that are bringing this motion because you were the one that was carrying an inappropriate relationship. You knew that this was inappropriate. You knew that you had hired this person to kind of help with uh, gathering the evidence and, and, and charging the, the co-defendants in this RICO case. This is all of your doing. So to get mad at people for something that you caused is wild to me. It should be wild to anybody watching this. And again, it gives the uh, allure and appearance to the former president and the co-defendants that are charging this of like, this is improper, right? So what else could she have swayed or, or uh, the, the prosecutor in this case, Nathan Wade, what else could she have swayed him in terms of charging these co-defendants? Now, to her testimony overall, again, legal, political. The problem is, is that we're losing sight of the yeah. 19 co-defendants and the RICO charges. We're losing sight of when this case will actually happen because we're dealing with this. And so the political part of this, it gives the ammunition to the former president to say, look at how politically motivated this is. Look at what's happening in Georgia with Fannie Willis. Mike Leon, thank you so much for your insights on this one.